This is Rebecca Jernigan, your tour guide into discoveries, coming to you live on this beautiful planet Earth, from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of discoveries, enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. What an exciting night here on Journeys. My guest tonight is Brian Unley. Our topic is called The Book of Man. And wait till you get into this. This is just absolutely going to be a fantastic night. Let me tell you a little bit about Brian, though, first, before we get into the actual topic. Now, you know when most kids were out playing and stuff, Brian spent most of his time in his childhood doing research and reading, go to the library, a lot of history, engineering. Comes from a military background. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And during all this time, he had been collecting just a ton of data and traces and pieces of stories um, that he had heard, seen, witnessed, and had no other probable need other than they existed. So when the computer came around, and yes, fortunately, he was around when the computer was invented, so much like myself, he purchased his first desk desktop in about 1990, and he proceeded to literally comb the planet for every piece of information he could find, including reports, records, databases, as well as contacting people from all over the world across what that time was an independent BBS system, for those of you that remember that. And then once the advent of the Internet, he was able to expand his work that include data collection for the reports and records acquisition of information that was not available in hard print books or public documents. Now back to the topic of the, of, of the uh, Book of Man. In 2009-2010, it was a culmination and uh, coalition of all this information that he had collected through the previous 40 years. When you think about that statement, 40 years, folks, that's a long time to disseminate, research, document, tag, otherwise save all these pieces of information. So the storyline follow, story follows these existing records, and he tells it in a third person. It starts millions and millions of years ago, far away from this planet. We're going to get into that. Though some may find these stories almost science fiction in nature, it is actually supported by scientific facts and tied together with historical precedents. Technically, the book is not science fiction, but rather an historical record one that has not been put together or told in one sequence ever before. And I'm going to tell you, I watched this because it's on uh, YouTube, he's got it in chapters, and I was mesmerized by the way that it was all put together. We're going to talk more about that as well. It really is truly one of a kind, first of its kind anywhere, and as such it does stand alone in the world of alternative information. The Book of Man is an Ascension is part two of the first book, and it's currently in production at this time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. But right now, what I want to do is I want to bring Brian on and welcome him to the show. Welcome, Brian. Welcome, Rebecca. <laughs> and for those of you who might recognize this voice, um, he usually produces my show, and tonight he's on camera. And behind camera tonight, or shall we say in the production end of it, is JP. So we want to thank JP for taking over so that Brian can be in front and center in regards to this topic of man, uh, the book of man. Um, so again, Brian, welcome to the to uh, Journeys with Rebecca in the forefront instead of in the background. It's really fun to have you here. Well, thanks, Rebecca. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I thank JP for coming in and helping out with this a lot because... Uh, We've all been working very hard to get Project Camelot Network up and running, and it's good to take a little break and do something like this for not just ourselves, but for, for everyone else out there who's been following the, 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 the travails of the network, so to speak. <laughs> There's been a lot of those, too, we have to admit. Even tonight, we had to change venues a couple of times, and we hope that we have gotten enough people to come forward so that we can certainly they can enjoy this in the live presentation. I will say that we'll probably be taking questions later on in the show. We do have a chat box there for people that are, are watching and listening. 
So if you have questions during the show, please do write them in the chat box. Put them in all caps so that we know that that is the question. And JP will get those over to us and we can ask those questions right on air of, of Brian tonight. So I want to talk a little bit about the whole premise of, of this. And I have to tell you that I watched, I watched um, it's on Vimeo. Uh, am I pronouncing that right, Vimeo? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's on Vimeo. Uh, there's 10 uh, chapters, for the lack of a better way of saying it. There's 10 chapters, um, and it begins in a really, really old story, and it brings us up to almost present day. And I find it really, really interesting the way that you have put this together. Uh, it was very succinct, um, and the graphics in it, the pictures in it, are fascinating, just fascinating. And I thought, I don't know how you got all those, but they're fascinating. So at some point, I'd like for you to go into that. But what I would like for you to do first, because you do come from a military background, so my thinking is is that you're pretty structured, or you were pretty structured, um, and that was what allowed you to do all this research and stick your head in books, because it was um, it was a way for you to get through because military life for a kid it can be a little rough around the edges and it was a way for you to get through as well as to capture your attention so why don't you talk a little bit about that and and what was the in my opinion everyone has a compelling force this was your your compelling force you had to do this and it started as a young kid well yes it did and and anyone anyone who's lived through the military and I do mean live through the military uh, it's had to adjust. Uh, you move every year or every two years. Um, you're in a different place every every year. You're in a different school. You're with different people. Uh, some people you never ever see again. So you don't grow up in, in, in a single community over time and get to enjoy the, the, the fruits and labors of, of your friends and neighbors and, and family. So you're, you're, you're isolated growing up. And in a lot of cases, there is no outlet for 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 study and learning, and and in a lot of cases, it seems like that the and I mean, just being just by human nature, there there's 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 an element there where you're a little standoffish. You don't want to necessarily participate in a lot of things because there's the fear factor. There's uh, obviously the the problems of growing up as a youth, and and so, to, for, for my benefit, the the falling into the library realm seemed to me to be the best way to go because that way I, I could just study, learn more, try to figure some things out that uh, both my parents were active and busy all the time. My father was being sent all over the world um, due to his, his, his work, and so he was hardly ever there. And, and my mother was socially active all the time. So there was no real mentorship there, and so I fell to the library system within the military to be able to to, to, to gain some education. Uh, and, and probably some stability as well. well of course. And of course friendship. I mean, books can be your friends, man. They take you on adventures that you can never otherwise have. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and not only that, you, you come across people within the libraries who have like mind. And you, you become friends, you share information, you say, hey, I just read this, take a look at this. You know, it, it's, it, I guess the, the, the quickest analogy for it would be saying, well, this was the earliest version of the Internet, was the uh, independent library system. Uh, <laughs> because you shared the information with people, you go, hey, look at this, look, look, I just found this, look. And, <laughs> and so, you know, you, you do that kind of stuff, but, but yeah, the, uh, the, the, the breadth of material that was available at the time was probably much better than the education system had available. I mean, I, I've, I've been through, and everybody's been through school libraries. They're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. Agreed. Uh, military libraries, on the other hand, have a broad assortment of literature that's not available or isn't present in, in public libraries and public school libraries. And so I had the, uh, the, the, the opportunity a uh, big opportunity to be able to have my hands on military documentation 
and uh, uh, U.S. historical archives that weren't available to the public. And so I ate that stuff up like it was gold. Right, right, right. Well, so you, you compiled all this information, but it became the information that you compiled and all these this research that you did actually came into under the umbrella of the history of man. And you call it the book of man. It's really the the beginnings of, of well, it's even pre man actually, when you stop and think about it. It's pre human. Human? Whatever. Human. Human, yeah. There you go. Um and uh there had to have been something that drew you to that topic that that I mean I'm not sure where that that tipping point came for you and I think that's what I'm trying to get to is where did that tipping point come where you were focused on something about what I'm being told doesn't feel right absolutely I mean basically this in this information in bulk is overwhelming for any single person to even even grasp, uh, it comes from uh, uh, scientific journals. It comes from historical records. It comes from uh, archaeological archives. It comes from uh, unbelievable volumes of, of data, and and to me it it had no point. It had no bearing, and and I didn't just dismiss it. It, it seemed important enough to to make a record of it, and so. Over the course of a long amount of time, this shifted from uh, historical and archaeological studies all the way through to uh, some of what can be called alternative material, uh, the UFO archives, uh, contactee uh, 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 experiencers information, uh, UFO reports, uh, sightings reports, and uh, over the course of a very, very long amount of time, uh, you start noticing coincidences, and as we all know, there are no coincidences. Right. Uh, but but again, there was no there was no point to this. There was no point to this function of, of collecting this information. Uh, it wasn't until about I'd say uh, mid two thousands that that I started to, once the internet, of course, was was active, and we were starting to be able to to retrieve information on on massive amounts of levels. Uh, that I started to actually be able to get in contact with people who, who likewise were, were studying this stuff and were sharing their viewpoints and opinions and information. And uh, sadly to say, it wasn't until about 2008, 2009 that I, did, I stumbled, literally stumbled upon Alex Collier. And uh, uh, Mr. Collier had been around for a very long time before that. Um, but it was during, during the course of, of following his lecture circuit and series on YouTube that some of the information that he was presenting, I, 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 kept, I kept going, wait a minute, uh, I know this. I know this story. I've heard this story before. And so I literally started pulling folders out of filing cabinets and going, wait a minute, there's this, this exact same story. I've read this before. And, and I started throwing this stuff on the floor and spreading it out and trying to connect it all. And over the course of a, about a year, I'd say, of following Alex Collier's lectures, it, it, it dawned on me that there was something to this information. And so basically what I did was I, I just started pulling the whole nine yards out. And piece by piece, the, the, the puzzle pieces started falling together, just based off of, of solely what Collier had, had, had presented us. And that's just one tiny piece of the puzzle. The puzzle is massive. It's just absolutely massive. And there's no way we can uh, 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 pinpoint uh, individual and unique stories that that define anything specific. There's just such a collection of it. Uh, so basically, at that point, uh, and this is still preceding the writing of the book, uh, it took another a year or so of, of, of collating the data, uh, connecting the dots, so to speak, literally connecting dots. Some of these fragments of information were so small and minuscule, they had no point, no bearing, no connection, no nothing. They were just incidental pieces of information. But 
if you started looking at them in the right light with uh, uh, connecting them to the piece before it or a piece after it, all of a sudden it just starts falling together. And when that was completed, uh, the book fell together in literally less than 45 days, the entire book. I mean, that's how fast this thing came up. Well, I have to tell you, is and I keep saying this for you, is, is the word is compelling. It was like you were compelled, you were compelled, you were compelled. When I see that in another individual, and I myself have had the same experience, but when I see that in another individual, that tells me that you're on what I call your your mission. Your your mission was is to get this information. You you spent 40 years of your life doing this, and you were like, well, I don't know why I'm doing it, and I kept all this stuff in these file cabinets over here, and in that paper back over here, and in that you know cabinet over there. And then all of a sudden the trigger mechanism, which in this case was, <clears throat> pardon me, Alex, right? So yeah. you you started pulling all that stuff back out, and you're like, okay, there it is. And then there's the compelling nature. That was everything that you have built up for, and you're just now beginning to allow that, all these things to come forward. Um, I can't tell you, I, I cannot find the words. I've been sitting here, by the way, all day trying to figure out how I was going to present this to the audience on how really well put together this, 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 your book was on Vimeo. I mean, it, it's written as well as anything I've ever read, I've ever read or watched. Thank you. So, I mean, I'm not saying that because you're my producer either. I mean, I mean that. It's, I was like, I was watching this. I was like, my God, this is, this is just absolutely astounding work. I'm blown away. And I am being as sincere as I possibly can be. So, I have to tell you, your 40 years you've spent doing this, um, it shows. Every ounce of that shows in, in these chapters, and I'm going to call them chapters unless you correct me otherwise, um, the ten chapters that I read in the Book of Man, the first book that you did. Yeah. So, okay. now, I, I, I'd love for you, let's, because we've been talking about the Book of Man, and and truly there's a an understanding that we do know that it was supposedly history, right? But I'd like for you to start from the beginning of there and long, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it goes right along with, with what my guys have been showing me and telling me for years, and I've never been able to articulate it in such a manner as you have, and um, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So maybe you can give us an overview of because there's a lot of points. You've, there's graphics that you want to talk about. There's there's a lot of different things that you want to bring up tonight. We talked about that before the show. So I'm going to kind of let you run with uh, those three or four things, and let's see where that takes us. We do have also a, a question if you want to uh, wait on that uh, until we get to a point where that's more... Um, it connects more with our conversation. We can. So just okay. to let you, let you know that we do have a question. We're aware of it, and... I think we'll we'll hold off on answering it until it becomes a little bit more closer to the time we're speaking of such things. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, just quickly for the viewer's sake, uh, there's the the book covers literally several hundred million years, and it, and it starts at the earliest records we have, and we have records, by the way, uh, of of bits and pieces of this information. Uh, the time frames that were set up within the book follow uh, a timeline, so to speak, that starts uh, in excess of 400 million years ago. And it moves forward in time as far as we understand it at this point. Um, uh, in, in another interview I had uh, over a year ago with Denise Wilbanks, uh, I, I mentioned the fact that this story pertains to third density. And it, it's it's absolutely important that you understand that concept because uh, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in this universe where you live in, and and <laughs> there was way too much to include. So basically, I cut this book down to the to the level that it starts from a, a, our reality, what we understand, what we can understand, and and 
basically what people who have never heard this material need to understand. And so uh, it, it basically starts like a history book. You know, here's when this happened, here's when this happened, and here's what happened when this happened. Um, it's very simple and very as straightforward as I could make it. And the reason I went with the third person, uh, a telling of the story as if it was from the future and this was just basically a history lesson, period. That's all this is. Uh, it's very plain, very simple, um, and it's not complicated, it's, it's not, uh, it, it isn't meant to overwhelm, and, and I don't think it has to this point, but um, again, starting over hundreds of millions of years ago and coming forward, it, it tells the tale of the origins of man. Now, the definition of man is a very broad one. Uh, this doesn't refer necessarily to the, the, the human being on Earth at this moment. Uh, the, the term man applies to a set of races that populate this galaxy, and there are loads of them, and they are all over the place. Uh, some people refer to them as humanoid, some people refer refer to them as hominoids. Some people refer to them as different names, different titles. We, I'd love to get into that discussion at a later time. Sure, but, <laughs> I would. For, for, the, for the time being, though, just understand that they, we are all related. Every single one of them. Us and the what I refer to in the book as the tribes of man. Because there are many, many tribes that live in different places, that do different things, that have different concepts of society, that have different different motivations, different agendas, uh, but it's the, it's the simplest way to do this was to do it as quickly as possible because it is such a broad story and there is so much going on. I had to leave. I actually edited, I would be willing to bet anywhere from 500 to 750 pages out of the book because it would have been overwhelming. It would have been too much, too much for me. Um, but basically it does. It follows the course of time. It, each chapter is an individual narrative, which tells its own unique story. Um, it's not meant to be for each chapter to be a separate story from the book, but in, in compilation, each chapter adds to the story of the book, and that's how the story is told. So uh, if you look at it that you will pick up pieces of this story as the book unfolds, then it, it should uh, open up a door or two for you. Oh, I think it opens up more than one or two doors um, because in the uh, in the premise of you doing this in a third person, right? There's there's also the visual that goes with this that makes it uh, way easier for people for comprehension. Because if you're a visual person, like I'm a visual person, um, I hear what you say, and then also the Graphics, the, the the moving pictures that you know the the movie itself that plays in the background, also helps to cement what's being said in the layers. I mean, whenever you say something, there's still layers to what you're saying, even if it feels like or looks like surface level stuff. There's also this other going on underneath it. So it doesn't surprise me that you edited uh, out a lot of the material. I just wasn't aware that you edited it out that much. I would really, really like to have a conversation on what didn't make it into the book because what made it into the book is fascinating enough for most people because it really does put it into a significant um, an understandable flow. And this is what happened here and this is what brought this on and then that's what happened there and then this is what brought that on. And so each chapter builds on the story or the icing of the cake. So with the visual part portion of it, tell me how you were able able to do that and match what you were saying. That was just bizarrely cool. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Rebecca, because the, the, the quest for the imaging was very, very difficult. And I don't have to tell you or, or any of the viewers that at all because uh, because of the topic, because of the information that's covered in the book, uh, uh, in in the right now in the storage of the folders for each chapter, there there are probably ten to twenty different images 
for each frame of, of, of the video production. And it took a process of, of placement and, and replacement to be able to sort out what would be the most appropriate image to follow along with the appropriate portion of the story. And in some cases, and in a few cases actually, there were a few images that there were so few practical images to have been uh, used that in, in one particular case uh, there was only one image that, that even supported the story and I was forced to have to use it. Uh, later on I discovered that there was a reason for that then it pertains to the second book. But, oh, okay. but the, the imaging itself, uh, I gave full credit to all of the authors and the, uh, the artists who did the artwork and the, uh, the, the photography that was involved in the, uh, in the production because they are solely responsible for that. Uh, phenomenal work, each and every one of them, uh, because they are high resolution, high definition images. They're absolutely gorgeous. And they, they weren't selected just for their, their uh, high definition, but because of the, the tone and the, uh, the presentation image itself was just absolutely spot on to me, at least I thought. And, and, and I hope viewers in time appreciate that as well. Well, I think anybody that has uh, ever looked at it will appreciate it, uh, Brian. Um, truly, I do. It's just magnificent. Um, because it goes right along with the story like you were saying. Um, so there's a couple of points in, in the book obviously that I'd like to get to and and, um, and I'm not even sure where to start. I'm sure I'm going to be popping around and I'm not going to be following the timeline. I'm trying to figure out how to do this in a in a manner so it doesn't confuse everyone but I don't know that I can do that so I'm going to try my best. Um, one of them has to do with the the debris field that um, resides out there, right? Um, I think they call it Kuiper's Belt. The, and, and the interesting thing is, is what we have been told is that there had been another planet and that planet had been destroyed. And that was what was caused the debris field. Now, and I may have missed it, but if you added that into the book, I didn't get that. So what's your take on that debris field? Is it a destroyed planet or is it an arbitrary asteroid belt? Well, I'm not what's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure about the about the Kuiper belt itself because uh, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I haven't seen any data regarding uh, origins of the Kuiper belt whatsoever. I mean none. If it's out there Somebody's hiding it because, uh, and I've looked for, believe you me. What I can tell you, though, uh, there is there has been a, a, a vast amount of information about the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And this information is leaning towards the existence of a previously known planet, which was destroyed unbelievably long periods of time ago. And... In my way of thinking, uh, I, I have a tendency to lean towards that. There is way too much uh, uh, debris in our on our own asteroid field to uh, just simply relegate to a particle construction of the solar system. And and I don't care what astrophysicist or what astronomer you pull up on the table, they have absolutely no idea where the asteroid field came from. And the what people have to understand about the asteroid belt, and I think this is an important point, is that you, you, you think and comprehend of portions of the asteroid field out there. What you have to realize, though, is that the asteroid field itself covers the entire solar system. It goes completely around the orbital sector of that field. That, that by itself implies a body of massive size. So, the, uh, but unfortunately I had to cut any, any uh, information concerning uh, a, a pre-existing planet or planetoid of that size in this system out of the book 
because there's no supporting data for it at the moment. There's a lot of conjecture, a lot of conjecture, and that's all it is right now. But until uh, more more reliable and more definitive information comes out, uh, I had to leave that out. Now, in the future, if, if somebody can identify specifically uh, that there was, in fact, a planet there, that it was destroyed, that there are the, the particle debris field out in the asteroid field has some relevance to a to a, a, a missing body, so to speak. Uh, I am already prepared to uh, even start a third book that would be a prequel to the Book of Man that would include that. But I had to pull that story out completely because there just wasn't enough data to actually uh, to include it. Okay, and that's fair enough because I do think that 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 that, that there's a, a bigger story than even the hundreds of millions of years ago. I, I truly do. Um, just based on the information that I have gotten about what what my guides have called the, the story of creation, which is the creation of all things, and it, they've watered it down and brought it into, you know, more uh, present day. So <clears throat> I would have to agree. And um, so obviously if there's any information, people will get a hold of you on regards to that because I think it's important that the more the more pieces that we can put together, the better understanding we have of who we are, where we come from, um, and it does help us to get over our own uh, prejudice, our own bias, our own fears, you know, all of the things that hold us back, yada, yada, yada. We've heard it before, right? But it, it, it really does put it into context. Well, I thank you for that piece of information. Now, the next thing that I want to talk to you about, because you don't specifically name it by name, and I'm, I'm sure there's reasons why you didn't, but in, in one of your chapters in the book, you, you, talk, you talk about a city, um, an island, and it looks very much like Atlantis. Was it supposed to be Atlantis? And you didn't name it that, or is it another, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, the... the I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. And and, and uh, I am absolutely prepared to answer any question uh, regarding this material. Uh, the reason that I picked that particular image for that for that part of that story is because I could, that's the only position I could identify that would make any sense to fit with, with the information that I had at hand. Now... According to the stories of Atlantis, and there's been lots of them, uh, and different ones, by the way, there is no carved in stone version of Atlantis at this point. Uh, there are several different stories concerning uh, uh, sort of like a United Nations of races having built uh, Atlantis. There's, a, there's an entirely another subset of, of stories concerning uh, what went on there, what happened to it, where they went, where they are. Uh, uh, it, at this point, once again, the data is not there. The, right. the, rel the relevant supporting information isn't there. Hell, we don't even have a location yet. I know. For real. I know. So, so I, I use that basically as a visual reference to define what that base was and why it was there. Uh, yes, uh, one could refer to it as Atlantis, but uh, in a loosely uh, in a loose set of terms, basically. Uh, it would be safe to say that its participation in this book, in this story, is would equate to the demise of it. Now, the origins and the original construction, uh, it's safe to say again that uh, uh, how it's related in this story is that uh, the race of man that basically finished it off uh, is responsible for that part of the story. Now, it's, it's origins. That's an entirely different subject. You know, speaking of origins, I'm, I'm going to pop around here on you. Um, because we, we've, you've talked about the human race, um, let's, I'd love for you to go back and talk about the players in, in, your, in your book. And when I say players, I'm talking about the the names that you are representing in your book about the different races and what they were called and who they created, et cetera, and so forth. 
the reason for that is because there's obviously when I looked at the names that you were given or I don't know I, I need to reframe that uh, when I looked at the names that you had researched in regards to the different races or cultures or civilizations or whatever that had created the next thing there's a similarity in the linguistics of it which I found very fascinating um, so maybe you could run through some of those um, if, if and I want you to think about this this way if you could you're looking at your your book for the first time and you're listening to somebody telling you a story about the who man and this one and the doll and da 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 if you give just a little bit of a description about your players right and yeah. a little bit of in-depth information I think it's going to help the people when they go back and they watch this because I'm hoping that everybody goes back and watches it and donates to you so you can do more work because I'm ready for the next one <laughs> well sure uh, uh, thanks Rebecca uh, the, the, the racial names that I used in the book um, uh, short of being obvious, um, did have relative uh, references, just so that you know. Uh, these names were pulled out of thin air, and they weren't made up. Um, the race names, uh, and that's a sore spot with me, because we refer, well, I don't say we, humans refer to these off-world entities by different names, or different call signs, or different uh, identifiers which are completely mistaken and wrong. Uh, even from a politically correct standpoint, they're, they're wrong. Okay. Uh, there are many, many races out there that are clearly identified, clearly understood. They have been seen, they have been photographed, they have been written about, they have been known for a very long time. And the names of the races, uh, for at least the ones within the book, are as close to the actual names as can be found. Now, there have been references for a certain race or two, which are similar but somewhat different. And I took it upon myself to find an appropriate phonetic conversion for the name that made sense and, and kept with the... Uh, uh, continuity of the telling of the story. Um, obviously, uh, I think I know what you're referring to as well about the uh, uh, about the uh, the appearance of the names linguistically. Right. Um, uh, the reason that was taken was because I needed to make this appear as non-human as possible and yet be understandable. And this was the only way to do it was by punctuation. But um, the, uh, for instance, the Dow and the Doll, their names uh, came up in, in several places, uh, not and not to, to demean it by any measure uh, Mr. Collier's work, but he was one of the major ones who actually pinpointed their name. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with who the Dow and the Doll are, they are what what some people refer to as greys. Right. This is one specific set of greys. There are many, many species of them. But this specific uh, one that was uh, told, the story that was told in the book, refers to a specific set of greys. Uh, and it, I'm somewhat miffed by having to use that word, but unfortunately, for commonality's sake, that's the easiest way to do it for the time being. The sure. Tao, the Tao are, are very ancient. They, they, they are probably one of the earliest races in this galaxy that, that has ever been uh, either identified or, or even uh, visually seen. Um, they are so old that they have long ago uh, fallen into genetic disarray to the point that their species almost uh, 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 came to a point of, of a complete annihilation. Right. And they were forced to genetically and scientifically enhance the, uh, the species to a point that they literally created a secondary subspecies called the doll. 
Now, this subspecies is actually another race, which existed on another system far away from where they originated from, but their, but their physical similarities were so unique that they basically adopted them as their clones. And they literally re-engineered the entire race. The, the, the original race has long been gone. There is no trace records of where they went or what happened to them. They are now literally those little small buggers with the black eyes that we see and hear about. Um, another race that was mentioned in the book is uh, the sea car. Now, there are yeah, several, there yeah, are several, yeah, I want to talk to you about that. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, there are several different species of them. Uh, uh, I actually got into several discussions concerning the sea car. Uh, uh, it, in an umbrella fashion, let's put it let's put it that way. Uh, they are referred to as the Draconian Empire. Now, this empire is literally many different species. There is not one specific species, but the 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 hierarchy of of the empire is literally a specific species, and they are literally the power holders of the empire. Um, they have different types, different subclasses, and there are many other different races and species that are organized within the empire that, that don't even have names. Some have been identified, some have not. Uh, the primary reason, though, that the, these specific races that I'm, I, I write about in the book and have shown in, in, in the series is, is the fact that they are the primary candidates in this story. They are the ones that are affecting what's going on here now, directly. The decision makers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a considerably large amount of stuff going on out there. Lots more than we're being informed about. We're, you know, honestly, we're only being informed now in the last, I don't know, a few years about a lot of stuff that's going on right now. Uh, people are popping up all over the place with little tidbits of information, and, and uh, I'm absolutely amazed. And uh, I follow a lot of this information as closely as possible in case there's something that, that may present some more backstory that I need to look into or, or, or maybe include in, in moving forward with it. Because, uh, but literally, the story of the, of the original Book of Man is, is primarily involved with uh, the races of man, obviously, because they're primarily involved with why we're here, and of course the other races that are primarily involved with seeing to it that they don't accomplish their mission. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, okay, so let me uh, let me let me just go here and 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 talk to you about the sea car. In the video, you mention. Uh, the C car and how they talk because we're talking a little bit about linguistics right and I've had a lot of people on the show as you well know and we're talking about linguistics and languages and these languages coming back etc and so forth you mentioned specifically and you and I have not had this conversation so this is what I found very fascinating um, you said that in in your book you said that it was it made a guttural sound and clicking, and that's its form of speech. Yeah. And I have been telling everybody about the being that I met on that ship as a contactee um, that spoke to me in this guttural and then clicking, and um, you could have called it. A species, subspecies of the sea car, because of the way it looked, but it was on this Babylon 5 like ship, so it was a rogue, a rogue entity being by itself. But I found that I was like, okay, I have got to talk to him about the sea car thing and this, this guy, because it's a language and they're speaking. But obviously, I don't understand guttural sounds with clicking noises and what that really actually means when they're speaking. Um, but I didn't get a negative impression. That was what I wanted to share. I didn't get a negative impression from this entity 
uh, as a matter of fact, you would think with this guttural noise that comes from where we would consider our throat, right? And then a clicking noise like that, you know, right. clicking, that it would it would sound awful, and it didn't. It didn't sound awful, and I think it was because maybe the meaning behind whatever it was he was trying to convey, or she was trying to convey, was a nice message. Sure. I don't know that for sure, but I would suspect because the ship was filled with all these individual entities from all over these races that you've been talking about, these tribes. Yeah. Very fascinating. Very fascinating stuff. Your book goes right along with all kinds of stuff going out there. I thought it was just really fascinating. So, okay, so we got the sea car. Now, the other thing that you did not specifically mention by name, and this is how we identify, I know you know what's coming, um, is the Anunnaki. I'd like to hear your take on that. Well, I have to. I had to stew over this for quite some time in the writing of it. I imagine. Um, and, and and in no deference to some very fine research being done out there and having been done out there, um, from a linguistic standpoint and a historical record standpoint, you have to understand the descriptions that we have of those who are called the Anunnaki is totally incorrect. Um, the Your dog agrees. Yes. She's a sweetheart. Um, but the word Anunnaki, if it does in fact exist, and I've actually read uh, 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 a skeptical uh, rebuttal to the uh, translation of the word Anunnaki. In in fact, that that word either did not really exist or it was a mis uh, translation. Okay. Uh, the technical, the technical, at least to date, the technical translation of the word itself, Anunnaki, in the early Sumerian, it, it, it implies those who came from the sky. Well, if you stop and logically think about that for a second, um, would I name myself those who came from the sky? No, I wouldn't. That word and that name was given by the early Sumerian writers. So technically, the Anunnaki don't exist. That is a, a misnomer, just like the word gray is a misnomer for the race called the Tao and the Dal just like the word reptilians is a misnomer for the race called the sea car under the draconian empire so we have to get out of this this old stodgy paradigm of, of misnomers uh, uh, in order to, to at least bring legitimacy and move this entire uh, debate concept forward well um, you know I like the idea of what you're saying there with that because um, we, we have a tendency to get stuck in things that we understand, right? So the the term Anunnaki has been around for, you know, many, many years. I mean, I've been hearing about them for 20, 30 years, I guess, um, talking about a specific individual called Anu, and they were supposed to be the Anu people, et cetera, and so forth, um, come from the Anu, which could be, uh, if, if we do some research, who knows, could be a... A species of those who came from the sky, um, and Anu was something, and they just tacked a name onto it and made you know everybody a descendant of this that, because they came from the sky as Anunnaki. But let's talk a little bit about your linguistics again. Um, with the interpretations of um, the written languages as well as the hieroglyphs, the you know the 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 pictorials, whatever that they're picking this up from, um, and I, I refer to going to Egypt a lot because it's it's the one place that I've went to that has writing as well as hieroglyphs as well as pictures and and it's it's varied in its form, right? And yeah. you have guides and they tell you, well, this is what this means here, and you know I'm I'm. I'm I'm certainly not versed in any kind of linguistics. I mean, I you know I have a hard enough time just with the English language, more or less anybody else's language, 
reading or writing or speaking, <laughs> right? But, it, you know, you, you just get a sense with it. And I can tell you from looking at that, I would walk in there and I'd go, that's not what the hell that means at all. That's not what yeah. that means. They're, and and you just know when you look at the pictures going, where did they get that from that? I mean, it just, you know, even from a, and it's not a left brain or function at all. It's just it's just this sense of that's, there's something not right here, just like in the Mayan calendar. Remember back in the 2000 when, you know, the end of the world was supposed to come 2012, right? Ooh, you know, the Mayan calendar. Well, and then, of course, then they go and they find an extra piece to it all of a sudden, right? Of course, it was after the fact. Oh, the world isn't really going to end. Well, hey, really? Oh, and guess what? This isn't what that said at all. So I no. think that we're, you know, we're dealing with, um, just like in the linguistics and the language, we're dealing with dead or unknown um, writings, information um, that we don't understand because we don't, have that knowledge yet we don't it's not been broad enough for us to say well this is what this really means uh, I could get on a on a on a debate and, and a, an entirely a different show simply on archaeological problems yeah uh, I mean let's let's call it what it is folks um, we have been lied to and 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 completely eviscerated from our history yes um, I'm not. I'm not going to claim that the fine work that's being done by uh, researchers and historians and archaeologists out in the field at this moment are doing a bad job because they aren't. They're doing the best job they can. Unfortunately, at the top of the pyramid, the finger on the button that's controlling the dissemination of this information has an entirely different agenda. And I think you have to be aware. And you have to be conscious of the fact that we, not only have we been lied to, we have been lied to non-stop for tens of thousands of years. There is nothing in our archaeological and historical record that is a factual truth. Nothing. There is nothing that we've been told is real. Um, once you accept that premise, then you have to start looking back and going, well, then if that's the truth, then this this implies this and this implies that. There's an entirely different set of structures that you have to you have to work with. And so, in, in constructing the book of man, I had to, uh, literally I had to release some of my own preconceived notions about what I thought things should be based sure. on what I was told. Sure. And, and when, once I started discovering that, well, what I've been told is wrong, then that reshaped the entire story. And so one thing leads to another. Um, uh, you have a benefit over me because you actually went there, and, and, and uh, I am so jealous. Oh. <laughs> because well, we'll have to make a trip there. We'll all have to get, we'll have to get some kind of a trip and go back there. They're, they're trying to get it back open again, so... Yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, let's let's we'll plan a trip. We'll make it a Project Camelot trip. Oh yeah. Um, um, oh my goodness, I had a great thought. Now I can't remember what it was. I was a, a train of thought I was gonna go with when you were talking about the deceptions. Um, now I can't even think of it. Um, I'll get to it. I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, when we're when you're talking about the dissemination of information, and and the fact is is that nothing in our history is truth, and it really isn't. Um, and your book lays that out explicitly. Even in even if people, even though you don't say that explicitly in those words, because of the way that it's presented, it starts the wheels turning in the mind and you're thinking, oh, well, if that's the case, then, then this must be the case, then this must be the case, and it begins to open up doors and it begins to open up the mind and it begins to take a different journey as to who really the controllers are. We've talked about the controllers. Many people have talked about the controllers. And at this point, before this, you brought this book out, 
for most people anyway, the controllers were, were just that. It was a name, much like your name is Brian and my name is Rebecca, right? Um, the controllers are an ancient, 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 ancient history. Yeah. Ancient. And if we want to know why we're always at war, you go back and study that. Sure. And and it makes you wonder where they came from. What brought them to this galaxy? What brought them to this point? Because they had to have a point of origin. Why did they do all this, right? Yeah. It's crazy stuff. When you stum it's this was where I got into trouble when I asked my guides about, well, you talk about eternal life or infinite universe or this or that. What the hell does that really mean? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My mind was just like, it just, it goes beyond the human capabilities at this point, at least in third dimension, to really grasp that. Yeah. The, what that really means. The, 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 the entire concept of, of living a lie, um, I mean, everybody understands it down at the personal level. You know, uh, we, we all have done it. Let's face it. Uh, we try to avoid that, but unfortunately, uh, it is what it is. But but having to have lived a social, historical, societal, planetary lie for tens of thousands of years, uh, th that alone is mind-blowing. Um, it is. The, and sad. And sad. But uh, uh, on, a, on a happy note, or happier note, um, the fact that, that, that now the awakening has begun, and it is, it's, it's happening, even as we speak. It's been happening for several years now, and people are not only waking up, they're getting angry about waking up. <laughs> it's usually the first response. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, there was actually a, a, a guy who covered this in detail about the steps of, of, of recovery, it's called. Uh, about the, 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 the emotional reaction to waking up and finding out, oh my God, uh, every, everything I've known and conceived of is wrong. Uh, what that does to your psyche is, is just, just it, it can be a bad thing, but it's not supposed to be. But, um, but yeah, the, uh, the fact that what we're doing at the moment, uh, all of us, uh, uh, you, uh, JP, for instance, he, he's doing a phenomenal job too with with, with the work he's doing, um, uh, and all the people that that are coming around to this. Uh, I hate to use the word paradigm, but that's what it is. Sure. Um, uh, I, I'm finding it exciting. I'm finding it fun because now there's there's, there's an association of like-minded people that are that are beginning to uh, open up and share information now. About the sharing of information, if you don't mind me stepping off a little bit here. Absolutely, it's your um, show. Um, there's another point that you have to understand about information. Okay, uh, I tried to convey this in, in my last interview. Uh, I didn't do a very good job of it uh, because it's not a, a simple thing. It's very complicated. But what you have to understand, though, is that all all of these people who are sharing information for you and with you and to you, um, they only have one piece of the puzzle. And that's all. The, there is no one central go-to bibliotheque, library, ascended knowledge, master, point of contention. There isn't. Um, we all get our own little piece of the puzzle. I'm given my piece. You're given your piece. Uh, everyone out there is all given their own unique piece of the puzzle. And it is our job to assemble these pieces. And the only way we can do it is together. Period. Now, uh, there have been some contentions about the information that I put forward in the Book of Man, and that's fine. Uh, part of the reason for putting it out there is to open the debate, to, to start asking the questions. Start uh, reasoning, um, but it is indeed the sharing of the information that's the primary point, and and I think that this is, is part and parcel of, of what it is we're trying to accomplish, not only individually but together as a collective, 
uh, especially and particularly here at Project Camelot. Well, that was actually very well said, Brian. Um, you know, we're all very compartmentalized. Even if we don't want to think we are, we are. Uh, just like you said, um, a lot of times people will go down a rabbit hole and that becomes their only focus. And they're very good at it. I mean, they're very good at taking a rabbit hole and researching it and researching it and researching it and they're they're pretty complete in that research but it is only a piece there's there's other rabbit holes that connect with it or go further or go next to it or whatever the case may be right, right. and I think it is really important and you said the word share you know as a as a host for almost 13 years now on radio and television. Um, whenever my guests have been on, I've always asked them to please share their information, share where the information that they have can be found, um, and et cetera and so forth. And I put it up on my website and put it in the newsletters, whatever, whatever, right? Um, it's such a rare thing, though, that anybody would take my information and put it on their website because we're still in that focus of this is all about me and I'm only using that as an example not as some kind of statement you know that oh people are treating me unfairly that's not what that was no, it was no. just an example it was a comparison right right but when I say share I mean share let's share let's let's do a back and forth let me share with you what I got let's see if it, it lines up with what you got and then sometimes you go oh well wait maybe you mean this and this is how you expand and this is how your picture gets bigger now you said this before we got on the show tonight you said look my information is changing all the time and and I so agree with that because what what I was explained with information say 20 years ago has been way tweaked since then Sure. So just because I knew that something was truth in 20 years ago, it doesn't mean that it's a lie now, but it means that it's been expanded upon. I have more information. I've had more experiences. I've connected with you know more dots, whatever the case may be. So that information isn't exactly as accurate as it was when it was first stated. It was stated yeah. when what you know at that point, right? Right. And that's what you were getting at with this book. You're saying, look, this book is an evolution, and it is. It's going to continue to evolve. Um, so what I'd like to do next is I've got some questions for you. Uh, some of them are you, you may or may not want to answer. I don't care. Like I said, it's up to you. I'll take my shots. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about, when you talked about some of the, I'll just call them tribes because that's what you call them in there, tribes and the different subspecies of these tribes where some of them went underground. And we do know here on Earth that there had been some nuclear issues. I mean, it's, it's evident. There's not a lot of people talking about it, which has always been an, kind of an amazing thing that this, this topic hasn't come out more than what it has in the past is that there had been nuclear detonations on this planet way before we found or discovered the nuclear bombs ourselves, right? Yeah. And there, the planet was inhabited. And some of them went underground. Are there still those that are underground, Brian? Well, underground is a... <laughs> Interesting reference. Uh, there's different versions of underground. Below our surface. Oh, below the surface. Okay. Um, that is a, a, a research point that I never really got into. Okay. Uh, that, that's not to deny its validity. Um, at this point, I can conceive of the fact of an entire race or several races living underground. I know for a fact there is one specific race here that I covered in the book and they are here they are here now they have been here for a very long time uh, as far as uh, one or several of the tribes of man residing here underground 
I have yet to see information conclusively regarding that. I've seen a lot of good stories, but um, in, in the telling of the story of the Book of Man, um, to have sidetracked to that storyline within the timeline and the continuity of this story, uh, it, it may have been justifiable, but it wasn't necessarily needed to complete the point of this story. Correct. Um, there, there, again, there are many races which are directly involved with what's going on here and in other places, which were not included in the book because the, the, the pertinent aspects were not necessary to the telling of this story. Um, here's a simple way to put this. This story is as simple as possible and was primarily told so that people who have never heard this story before or heard any portion of this story would at least have the ability to comprehend the simplicity of the story and be able to go, wait a minute, okay, I heard something about that. And basically, that may strike some people who may be too simplistic. But again, once you, once you get somebody on board, once you've opened up one mind and one door, the rest follows. And so, uh, further further delving into the story of, of, of subsurface realms is a problem that, that could be addressed at a later date. Uh, in fact, I only just recently, my own personal self, just recently discovered that a scientist report came out that the, the, the volume of, of liquid water below the surface of the earth exceeds the volume of the surface water. And this comes from direct scientific observation from infrared and, and radio sound and, 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 and other applications. So somebody out there is doing the right research. And has found out that the uh, subsurface planetary water table is considerably larger than the surface water volume. Uh, that's, a, that's an astounding uh, release of information. And, and if you stop and think about it, that's an astounding volume of water. It is, because there's a lot of surface water. Yeah. There's a lot of surface water. Wow, fascinating. Well, I haven't seen that. That's pretty fascinating. All right, so let's let's move let's move into a different direction here. Let's go ahead and take some of these questions because okay. I think it's going to spurn us into some other directions here. Um, I have to read this. Do you believe? I'm, I think agree. What time you think history has been hidden or changed timeline wise? Do you understand that question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, When the timeline, not necessarily a timeline, when, when our historical record was changed, uh, it's roughly a time period. There, there, there is no single date or place or personal reference that we can say, so-and-so so did this in this place at this time, and they were responsible for it all. But there is, there is enough evidence to show that the time, the timeline of our history has been changed, and it can all be centralized to one general location, place, and time. Um, which is? Which is uh, pre-Egypt, approximately where the book ended. And that's approximately 12,500 years ago. And, and this is just a general, a general range figure at this time. It's very possible that the timeline was changed long before that, but this is the point that can be traced back through existing record that about 12,500 years ago, whatever happened, and I will be covering this in the second book, when it happened and how it happened, but uh, about 12,500 years ago, the decision was made to completely alter the records of this planet. And I kind of lean towards that during the telling of the last chapter or two. And if you had been paying attention throughout, or if anyone had been paying attention throughout the course of the book, uh, showing the timeline at the introduction of, the, of each chapter, 
with the last chapter falls in twelve thousand five hundred. Right. Uh, that's that's pretty much where that decision was made. Um, and, and and just for point of reference, this was pre Egypt. Uh, right. I have spent a great deal of time trying to either include or eliminate the Egyptian race as being involved. And they, I am pretty sure at this point, they are not involved. Involved they, in the changing of the timeline, no, you mean? No, oh, yeah, okay. Yes, they are not involved. They have no concept of this. They have no concept of, of pre-Egypt. None. They have less of a concept of pre-Egypt than, than than the Americans do of pre-colonial Britain. So, um, that's, sorry to say, that's a sad statement about historical record, but that's the truth of it. Okay, so, if you're saying that, if you're saying that, how do I want to word that? Um, if you're saying that they weren't involved in, in the changing of history, are you saying that they weren't here before then, or they were already here and just were not a participant in the changing of the information? Uh, maybe I should clarify that. Yes. Um, they may not have been directly responsible for the changing of our history, but the decision to put a kibosh and an ultimate halt on truthful dissemination of historical fact was made long before the existence of the Egyptian culture. Okay, okay, that's more clear. Yes, okay, that's clear. Okay. All right, well, thank you for that. Now, just as a kind of a side note here, when I look backwards into time, if, if you want to say that, it doesn't always feel backwards to me, but when you look backwards into time, I get a void space um, when I look back to figure out where we came from and and I get this void space and I go through this void space and then I, I pick up a timeline behind it right where I can see stuff right but there's this void space that I don't get anywhere else out there looking at stuff just a void space I have no idea how many tens of thousands of years that void space is but it doesn't seem to me like it's all because there was a nuclear holocaust and you can't see anything or nothing existed it it it's it's always been a little disconcerting this is the first time I've ever brought that up by the way ever yeah. so I now that I've said it then something may come through so if I get something I'll share it with you that was just kind of a little side note there okay uh, on to the next thing I was interested in the star charts oh yes yes those star charts are fabulous those are fabulous in the video some I have never seen and from what I see uh, Brian uses them as points of reference in fact are the star charts correct in the region from explained from from explained in the chapters well that's a good question um, mm -hmm. the the star charts that are used within the within the book are actually factual those are existing star charts um, just for uh, uh, yours and viewer point of reference um, I did years of astronomical research in locating or identifying uh, these positions. Um, there are many, many programs available even at this at this point in time that one can uh, uh, freely access and you can call up these star charts or, or references or, or 3D uh, representations of these areas in, in our known space. Um, but by and large, uh, during the course of, of, of the original writing of the book, um, what I did discover, and this is an interesting point to go along with the star charts, by the way, is that the star charts refer to what we know as our current 
uh, man-made named star systems and solar systems and, and constellations and regions of space. But what, what everyone must realize is that originally there is in a complete original set of star names and star system names that are in existence. Anyone who's done their astronomy homework will find this out. Uh, these names derived from an early Arabic source, which to date has been unidentified. No one knows where these star names came from. Now these original Arabic named stars became later named stars and star systems, which are in the current references. And so in looking back at these star names, silly me, the question came up, well, why did we change them? <laughs> yeah, why did we? If the original if the original names worked, then then why did we change the star names? So uh, there's a point of consideration, but the star chart the star chart names, uh, and even in some of them, they also make uh, you'll see a, a current reference of a star name with a uh, previous origin star name in parentheses, either below it, next to it, or or uh, accessible. May not be on the chart, but it'll be accessible. And, and this question has always bothered me, it's, uh, talking about getting bothered. <laughs> uh, but, but I decided to go ahead and use the original names of the stars just to suit the purpose of the story. Um, star charts are very fascinating to me. Um, and every time I look at them, I go, I don't. I, I can't relate to it, so it ha it's it's got to be the name, right? Because it's not triggering anything other than, you know, a furrowed brow going. Well, that doesn't seem right. You know, why why is it named M three seven eighty or whatever it is, right? Well, or that's the right. system. No, it isn't. I don't know what yeah. it is, but it's just you know. But I have to tell you is that um, I went through a period of time in two thousand eight where I I was I was having what I call my blue visions. Everything was in shades of blue. Uh, this went on for months, these blue dreams, blue beings, blue dreams. One of the things that, that they did was they set me out, literally, out in the middle of space. I pulled up a chair, a blue chair, and I was shown star chart after star chart after star chart after star chart, and none of them were from this galaxy. Uh -huh. And so this is the kind of information that I've been given, and I don't know what to do with it. So when I seen your star charts out there, I, I it made me recall you've by me going through your your book here, Brian. It's it's done a, a huge resurgence of recall with some of the things that I've went through to try to figure out. Well, where does that piece go in? Remember, we're all carriers of the piece of the puzzle. Right. And I truly believe that. As a matter of fact, I know that. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, okay, so. What do I do with this information that I can't relate to anybody because it's not of any known star systems or galaxies? Where do what do I do with it? So it's set here for what seven years now. I've had it for seven years. I can't tell you what it is, but it doesn't belong in this galaxy. That much I do know. Well, I mean, in, in, in all obviousness, uh, Rebecca, what 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 I would do is uh, I would physically draw them out myself. It, it, Have you seen a, my drawings, Brian? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some of them. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, star charts are pretty simple, really. It's a series of dots connected by lines, really. Well, that's true. And, that. and uh, the, the, earliest, the earliest known recalled uh, star system representation was the Betty and Barney Hill system, which wasn't discovered. If you remember the story, it wasn't even I, you know vaguely enough. I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that star chart, that that really perked my interest because um, I remember when it first appeared. It was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And then, and then, and then a few years later, uh, 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 yes, yeah, scientists have discovered a star system that coincides with the what Betty and Barney Hill drawing. Oh my God! It was like you're kidding me, right? Uh, a, either they didn't know this for real, 
and discovered it by accident, or B, they knew about it all along, and once again, withheld the information from us. Yeah, it's kind of hard to decide that now, isn't it, knowing what you know, right? Yeah. I mean, it is. It's kind of hard to know anymore. Well, is anyone telling the truth about anything, right? You know? That's crazy stuff. All right, well, let's get to the next question here. Uh, of course, this is when we were talking about Atlantis, so this we're kind of back up here a little bit. Is the name Atlantis in itself misleading? Uh, and may want or may want to look at Atlantic region just because of the mail? A too late moved? Okay, so let's let's just Atlantis itself. Is the name Atlantis maybe misleading? That that again is another very interesting question, simply because of the fact that um, I too have researched as far back as we have records for, and there are no references to Atlantis other than Pl uh, Plato's. Um, the interesting point, though, I think should be pointed out here, is is that in all, all the research that, that many, many people have done, <clears throat> one thing keeps coming back to the same thing, and it's the same thing that I've did and the same road I've gone down, is that it's a coincidence that the name Atlantis coincides with the name of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, uh, many decades ago, I, I decided to go down the road of the Atlantic Ocean story. And I dare anyone to go back as far as you can and find the origin of the name, the Atlantic Ocean. There aren't any. There are no references to the Atlantic Ocean. Who named it? Where that name came from? Um, there may be incidental reports of it first being used. But that does not define origin. Right. Origin is Bob in 11 BC said, <laughs> this is what this is. Right. That's an origin story. Right. And, and to date, there are no origin stories for the, the naming of the Atlantic Ocean or where that came from. So, yes, uh, not being a coincidental person, uh, I don't think that, that there is such a, a broad disconnection between Atlantis and the Atlantic Ocean. There is a connection there. What it is, I have no idea, and there is no evidence to pinpoint one way or the other. Well, okay, so let's let's take a look at our geology, on, on uh, our geography on this planet. Um, if it is older than, say, the 12,500 years, which is what everyone is saying, is Atlantis would be at least that old or older if in fact it did exist yes yes okay so if it resided someplace in the Atlantic or if it was um, some kind of a um, landmark or something at some point that resided in the ocean and that's how it got its name I mean we're talking you know prehistory here right? right we don't know who named it but Atlantis could have existed <clears throat> but because of the geological changes um, the wars the, the, the uh, catastrophic events that took place on this planet we don't know that it wasn't wiped out systematically you in your in your book you you mentioned quite a few times where races had been here and they or other places and they systematically took away all the um, remnants of their being here yes and it could be something <clears throat> that simple that it, it did exist we don't know in what capacity and and this is where the Atlantic Ocean and Atlantis somehow is interconnected that it may have been a place or a space at one point and it may Atlantic Ocean may have come from a geographical location, um, right. maybe something that was actually a, um, an island or the land connected or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> yeah. Lots of changes to this planet physically. Well, yeah, and and everyone has to understand uh, another point about that. 
is that even even to this very day, we are discovering literally cities, whole cities, at the bottom of the sea. Um, it is safe to assume, from a layman's standpoint, that this planet did not look like it does now when it did a hundred million years ago. Uh, it is very possible, and I've, I've even considered this, I, I, I haven't really done any research into it at this point, but it is possible that this planet didn't have any water on it. That this planet, or what water it did have, was, was minuscule at best. Maybe rivers and a few lakes, but no oceans. Because if you look at some of the locations of where these cities are, they are hundreds to thousands of feet below the sea. Uh, no, I don't think that was tectonic plate sinking. Uh, there's no evidence to show that. Not at this point. If, if tectonic plate sinking had occurred and just literally dropped a city a thousand, two thousand feet into the ocean, uh, there would have been massive destruction to that city. To the, to the point to where they wouldn't have found them intact in the in the way that they found them, which implies that the water came later. So if you take that premise, it is safe to assume further that there is possibility exists that there's still some several cities. It's sitting at the bottoms of some of the deepest chasms of the of the oceans on this planet that we haven't even come across yet. Well, you and I haven't come across. Right, them. they know you, they're there. The United States Navy has come across them. And, you know, and speaking of that, uh, tonight earlier, I was watching a show um, where they were using uh, a new, well, it's new to the general public, right? It's new, it's not new, but the technology is using some kind of a, like, it's like an MRI, but they, it's, it's a nuclear resonance um, imager where they can go in and they can now look at it from satellite, right? They can look and see whatever, if there's gold deposits, if there's, you know, human beings, if there's shipwrecks or whatever the case may be, and they can do that right from the air. So you tell me that they don't know where all this stuff is. i got news for you. They do. That's another one. Of, that's my bones of contention is that here's all this fabulous information, and yeah. it's not being shared. Oh, of course not. Uh, uh there has been, I mean, if you go back to the to the concept that we've been lied to for tens of thousands of years, uh, they didn't just stop at lying to us. They they actually halted the dissemination of any information or any pertinent information. Let's put it that way. Uh, the the fact that they stumble upon pyramids and then turn around and deny their existence or say, well, it was a uh, religious temple uh, in 900 A.D. That's right. I love that. Um, Everything's a religious thing. Yeah. Everything is a religious site, and um, uh, uh, the race, even though they've vanished off the face of the earth and no one knows where they went. Yeah. So we don't know how they did this. But we do know. It's like, yeah, okay, uh, I would make several gestures right now, but I won't. I know. Machu Picchu. <laughs> Machu Picchu. One of my favorites. Oh, listen, 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 listen. When I seen that video portion of the Machu Picchu, because we're talking about geographical locations, right? Yeah. Um, and just all of the people are just suddenly gone, right? And how many places have we seen? Like, I mean, there's places here in the United States where civilizations existed. And now all of a sudden they don't. They're just, there's just, they just like left the building, right? Well, how do you do that without leaving it? You know, they didn't just all die. They didn't all just get up and, you know, walk 500,000 miles away, right? Yeah. So, hello. You know, it's like, yeah, I was born last night, just, or I wasn't born at night, just not last night, right? There yeah. you go. Well, it, 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 just so you know, uh, and I'll throw this one on the table for you to play with. Uh, oh, good. I only just recently learned that they discovered an ancient race in China that is so old, there are no current records of them ever having existed. In other words, they didn't just disappear. They didn't fade into ancient glory. They disappeared off the face of the earth, literally. 
and left behind archaeological artifacts of a type and nature that supersedes anything for the next 50,000 years. And they don't know, they don't know how to explain this one. There, there are no documented writings of this, of this race. There are, and that's in China, by the way. You would think someone in China would have stumbled across them at the time of their demise or during their existence and would have relayed that information through writings and, and, and script and libraries. No, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And there's been several of these races that have disappeared. And which leads to the further questions that don't want to be answered by those people. And so I'll leave that one to your capable hands and the <laughs> viewers. Well, let's talk about them for just a minute. So they found this this um, civilization that's no longer there. They found remnants of this civilization, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, well, you know, China doesn't... It, it, why are we not hearing about it? Well, why do you think that is? Well, I can tell you why that is, but uh, it's... It's my own personal conjecture at this point. Well, I like uh, conjecture. Well, uh, obviously the information is being withheld. Uh, it's why it's why archaeological teams from all over the planet are scrambling right now to not only get their fingers into these sites, but either to destroy, hide, or mess with the record. Not because that's the right thing to do, but because that's what they've been told to do. Right. And they've been told to do this by several different organizations. Many of them I will cover directly in the second book, but uh, we've all talked about them. We all know who they are. Sure. They're just a question of, of actually basically setting the evidence on the table and let's have a conviction. Because... Uh, the time is coming very quickly to where this this methodology that they they seem to want to pursue of 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 hiding and lying is no longer working for them. It's not working in their benefit, and so especially with with the volume of people that are coming forward with this information, going wait a minute, that's that's crap. The Great Awakening. Yes. It's the Great Awakening. So let's move it back to. Egypt for just a minute. Sure. Of course, now, now they've just newly discovered that uh, there's some tombs behind. Um, oh, what's his name? It's right out the window. But anyway, Nefertiti. They think Nefertiti's tomb now is behind a tomb that they've already excavated, and there's another hidden room. So they feel like there's two of them, and then of course, you know. Now all of a sudden there's tunnels underneath the Sphinx, and there wasn't any before, and yada yeah. yada 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 yada. Right. When you go there, when you go there, and I do hope you get to go there. When you go there, you just you sit in the middle of all this and you listen to what the guides have been told to tell. By the way, they have to go to school for this in order to become a tour guide. Oh, yeah. It's very fascinating. Yeah, they have to be certified and all this stuff in order to be a tour guide in Egypt. So they give the correct history of what this means and what that means and who was here and blah 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 all that stuff right and our guide was really open by the way he was a fabulous guide because he would say this is what I'm supposed to tell you he would always preface everything by saying this is what I'm supposed to tell you so a couple times I asked him I said so what do you think about that really what you're you know against what you've said how do you really feel about it he says I and, you know, he'd just kind of be quiet because it was his job. Yeah. And, you know, but you could tell that, you know, you would say something, he'd just kind of nod his head, but he wouldn't say a word. Yep, that's right, that's right, that's right. But, <laughs> yeah, and so I think, and I, I will tell you is that there's been a lot of um, fanfare around Egypt, right, uh, with what could be there, what might not be there, who was there, et cetera, and so forth. I do think that they have taken out a ton of artifacts and information that could have given us some of that history 
of pre-Egyptian times. I believe there was some information in there and is certainly at this point not going to be open for public viewing or even knowledge at this point. Oh, and of course it won't be either. And and that goes back to the the entire the entire message of, of the lie. Because the sciences are supposed to be true and faithful to the masses. And that includes archaeology, by the way. Yes. And archaeology is is simply the recovering of historical artifacts and the presentation of those artifacts to the masses to help explain what has happened in the past. That is all. That is all it's for. And yet they take it upon themselves to manufacture its uh, resultant uh, use. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, what, it, what it would mean to the society as a whole. I mean, these are sweeping decisions being made at levels that, that most people just don't even comprehend. And the fact that you were there, you've seen them with your own eyes, the, these tombs and, 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 and whatnot, that, that were restricted from public view. Yes. Uh, not because they were afraid you were going to mess with the site, but because you might discover something down there that doesn't fit the normal paradigm story. Uh, and or either that or or until such a time that they can create and manufacture the proper story before releasing this information to the public. That's correct. Um, the only the only anomaly to that is I will tell you is that there was a uh, a tomb or temple or it was an underground um, we'll, we'll call it an underground temple because I don't know what else to call it. Um, it was the anomaly to everything because most everything was Egyptian in nature uh, with a few exceptions. I mean you go in there and you'll see a few things but this one happened to be filled with all kinds of extraterrestrial type of information. Spaceships, uh, drawings of you know little gray men, right? Mm -hmm. um, et cetera and so forth. Um, and that one is open but it's not one of the main places that they usually take people right. um, but it has been excavated it is available if you have the guy that will take you there and they have to get special permission to bring your group in there oh. it's fascinating yeah it's fascinating really really fascinating yep. a lot of weird strangeness in in Egypt um, there was a story in when we were in the uh, south part of Egypt which I think they call it the I think it's upside down. I think they call it the, the top of Egypt or something. I don't remember what the terminology is. Um, where there were some museums, where there was mummies in these museums, and it's just a little tiny hole in the wall museum. I mean, it's and, and you had to have somebody meet you there to unlock it to go in. And in the middle of the day, it was yeah, just kind of odd stuff, right? You know, not like we. You certainly aren't in the United States when you're there. I can tell you that. But anyway, you go on and you hear the story, and the story is is that they had taken like 200 of them or something out of out of a place where they, and they had moved them but there was also like a massive quantity of gold and a bunch of other things that never ever made it to the museum just gone sure and different different mummies and why would so you have to ask yourself okay so why would they take a mummy or mummies and not not put them on display because there's something there they don't want you to see. There yeah. was something unique or un unusual or what have you about them. So that's it. It and you know this. It, we may seem like we're off track here with your book, but when in fact, what we're doing is talking about the fact that everything that we've been told is not true. Everything, correct, including where we come from, who we are. It's, Absolutely. It, okay, I mean, right. Let, let's. Let's, let's put it this way, the and, and, and predominantly you would be amazed at, at, at the, some of the discussions that I've seen and heard from, from very smart people uh, regarding, oh, archaeologists wouldn't lie to us, the Smithsonian wouldn't lie to us, 
you know, these astounding institutions wouldn't lie to us. Yes, they would. And they do, and are, regularly. And, and the problem is that uh, until people can get to the point where they see through that, that it, that it equates down the, as they say, stuff runs downhill. It, yeah. also, it also equates to the media. It equates to the governments. It, equa it equates to your local municipality. Everything runs downhill, ladies and gentlemen. We have been lied to and are being lied to on a day-to-day -day basis, regularly. And it's time for the lie to stop. And I could go on about that. I'll stop. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we can all get on that bandwagon, at soapbox, whatever you want to call it. So let me ask you this. You, you, you compiled this information, and, and it's, and again, I, I, I encourage and urge people to go and watch uh, your videos, the different chapters. I, I absolutely do because it will open their eyes. Um, the visuals that go with it, uh, the way that you presented it was, was just beyond stellar. It was just fantastic. Thank you. So as you were putting all this together, and I'm talking about not just the first book, not your second book, because your second book and your subsequent third book that will come after that, um, what was the some of the bigger points that that you got from this? I mean, we all have epiphanies and aha moments, and and going, man, I didn't, you know, I had all this pieces of information. It's like a puzzle piece. You start pulling one here, one here, one here. Pretty soon. You got this big piece, and you start looking at it, and you go, whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So the, what happened for you? Well, there, there were points. That basically, the book was written four years before the uh, I, I, I embarked on a video series. And the, the decision to go ahead with the video series was, like, instantaneous. And so I, I had basically the running script in the book. So I just went with it. And, and the video series was produced directly from the book. The funny thing though is, and indeed you're correct, is, is that even, even now, afterwards, uh, I can go back and, and watch one of the chapters over again uh, and I do this regularly just for nit my own nitpicking sake, you know, it, in production, you, you want to make things better next time. So, you know, you re, you, oh, I do, I rewatch stuff and, and, and try to pick at the pieces, so I say, well, I can do this better next time. But during the course of that exercise, I stumbled across some bits and pieces in the stories that I went, that's not what I intended. Where right. the hell did that come from? Um, it's, it's a point about some of the imaging. There's a particular picture in the first chapter that, that like I said, it, it was the only picture I could find to use. And I, so I said, okay, fine, I'll use it. And it wasn't until probably the end of last year, beginning of this year, it dawned on me there's a reason for that picture to be there. It's because it, it directly pertains to the second book. And I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, someone did. It wasn't me. <laughs> well, it was maybe your higher self. Yeah, but yeah, there there are things that go on within the story itself that carry on throughout the book. There there are undercurrents in the story that I did not put there. I really sure. didn't. Sure. But 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 I have discovered them over time, and and I would I would suggest. To viewers who, who haven't seen it yet or have seen it and need to review it again to do it in series one after the other I mean sure you can cherry pick a chapter you want to see specifically and that's fine but you're gonna miss out on the story if, if you do that so to start from the beginning go right to the end suffer through it uh, I know a lot of people who have and and the discussions that, that come from that are, are phenomenal I did <laughs> yes you did I went from the beginning to the end. The only thing I didn't do was the postscript. Oh, that's fine. 
I will do that, though. I, 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 I thought it was all done. I wasn't even thinking that there was another one. I was like, okay, well, all right, good. So, you know, but I am going to go back and, and listen to it again and watch it again. So when you said you directly took it from the book, is this verbatim for the book, or is is the book got a, a little bit more dialoguing in it? Oh, the, the book's written. got... Yeah, yeah. The, the book's got some things in it that aren't in the video series. Uh, I left them out just for time's sake and for uh, what I will refer to as continuity's sake. Uh, it, the, to keep the story as short as it is, and believe me, it's short. Yes. Uh, it's even for six and a half hours of nonstop viewing. Right. Uh, uh, there, there, are, there were things uh, in the original written book that uh, I pulled just simply because... Uh, it, a, it didn't need to be there. It didn't assist the story, and and, and B, that uh, were just basically superfluous information. Um, that's one reason why the story moves so fast. Uh, there isn't really a lot of time to stop and sidetrack to to cover a, a particular point in more detail. So it just keeps moving, and it, it is. It's it it's it's. Even to me, I don't know about anyone else, but to me, it's compelling enough to just keep going because it just not stop. And and that's I think was the words that I used at the beginning of, of this uh, time with you tonight, which is the uh, the compelling force. What was you know it was it's and it is compelling. It's compelling. I, it's like wanting to what's next chapter? What's in the next chapter? What's in the next chapter? Um, and and I think. I would like to sum some of this up for people that are listening and will be listening to this at a, at a later date. The, the book talks about the history of the human and where that originated from within this galaxy, from as far back as you could pick up the information from, as far as uh, research and documentation, um, all your different sources and you name all of those where, where this information comes from. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that people understand because in it is a lot of things that you can go super wide on such as the genetics, the linguistics, the, the different subspecies, the, the different locations within uh, the solar system and the galaxy and, and the interchanges um, and exchanges. There's uh, so much depth that, that can be covered um, specifically that is is not included because if you did include it we couldn't even begin to have an interview about it <laughs> <laughs> just too much information yeah. you're talking about millions and millions and millions of years worth of history yeah. not just a couple hundred thousand years millions and hundreds of millions of years uh -huh. and, and another point too is that because of the volume of the information um, I myself could not cherry pick a specific point and just delve into that um, it wouldn't serve the purpose of the story no um, and, and I've been asked about uh, well why did you include this and why didn't you include that and and, there's, uh, and I said it earlier. There, there were several several directions I could have sidetracked and, and, and covered either briefly or in more detail, which I elected not to. And it was an editing choice more than a personal choice because, in in order to tell the story, um, it, it's my way of thinking of having lived in libraries most of my life. Good stories do their job, and they tell that story. And so to deviate from that story would have been would have been a negative influence on the story itself. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't negate those portions or, 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 or inclusion or exclusion. It just means that this story had to be told in its form in its current form. Um, well, I just lost my train of thought on that. Oh, don't you just love that when they just go away like that? It's just like somebody just put up a roadblock and you smacked right into it and you go, okay, where was I at? Whoa. All right, so let's let's go to the next point. You you have started on the second book, and it's called The Book of Ascension, yes? Yeah, The Book of Man, Ascension. Book of Man, Ascension, okay. 
Um, and you have a few of those video chapters up or chapters up on that? Uh, not at the moment, no. Okay. Um, you got two trailers. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of trailers to, to announce its upcoming status, but um, this one's going to be uh, attacked in an entirely different manner. Uh, the first book was entirely written from beginning to end before the video series ever started. Right. And basically I took the script from the book and, and built the entire series. This one, if I did that again, if I tried to write the entire book um, and then do the series properly, which is actually maybe the re or the choice to it I should make, I've decided to go ahead and do it one chapter at a time. In other words, write one chapter and then do the do the film series of it, because that way I can get it out a little bit faster and uh, and hopefully at least keep interest in the, in the series. As we all are pretty much aware, there's somewhat of a short attention span theater out there, so. Uh, uh, the, the need to get it out, the story needs to get out, it does. Sure, sure. And so, and to uh, expedite that, I'm going to need to do it one chapter at a time. Now, the, the first chapter has, it is complete. Uh, I'm in the process at, the ver at this very moment uh, doing the film work for the first chapter. Uh, I had an expected uh, target release date for the first chapter to be sometime towards the end of October. I've run a little behind on it due to other things. And, uh, but I, I'm going to put a carved in stone deadline <laughs> on the first chapter and it will be out soon. Good, good. Well, when you uh, get a few chapters under your belt, we'll bring you back in too and let's talk about where you're going with your next project there as far as the ascension aspect on the Book of Man. Mm -hmm. um, now, I watched it on Vimeo, right? Um, why don't you tell everybody how they can either watch it and or get the book, et cetera, and so forth. Let's. Um, I have it all pasted, by the way. It's on my website. It is on my uh, broadcast page. I think what I'd like to do, Brian, is to go ahead and just leave that information up for people. Sure. Um, because they'll be watching this. A lot of people will be picking this show up later, and I want them to be able to to find that if they're listening, they don't have a pencil and paper, they don't want to, you know, rewrite it or what have you. Um, but if you've got websites, whatever, let's let's get that information out right now for people. Sure. Um, the the book series is on Vimeo. Um, it's in it's what they call an album, rather than putting up the individual videos as like a single user. It's in a a structured album so that you have all of them right there in front of you and you can view whichever ones or all of them at your leisure. Uh, the address to the video album is uh, 270 I know that's kind of not like a phone number to me. But uh, that's the uh, Vimeo.com album 270-1770. Uh, again, that's on your website. It's also, it should be listed in the uh, the text below this stream and uh, on the subsequent video. Um, my uh, my user page on Vimeo is also listed. Uh, there are a trail to follow with that. Uh, if you can get to the Vimeo address, uh, I also list the blog and the uh, uh, I believe that goes to a Twitter account, my YouTube account. Uh, those are just secondary as, as, as a stream of information for people or an access point, but the Vimeo is the primary channel. So uh, I would I would ask people at least go have a look have a look at the introduction. If uh, if the introduction doesn't perk your interest, then uh, the rest may not. I don't know. Well, I think it will, and I'll tell you why. One of the things that it talks about in there, and it, it shows really specifically, Brian is. Uh, the wars. Um, many people have been talking about, well, you know, the Star Wars thing, and I'm not talking about the franchise on this planet, but they've been talking about the Star Wars and the wars that have went on. Um, it's it's prevalent in in the history of 
uh, the human. Um, I think it's also part of the coding. It's also part of the structure. But all of that warring information, I think, is what people what I'd like to draw people's attention to just because it's always been that way doesn't mean it has to stay that way I think that's part of this awakening process and a part of the uh, ascension process I think is where you're going with your next book I don't know I haven't spoken with you about it it's not like I have first-hand information I'm just yeah sharing yeah. Um, <laughs> um, that being said I, I I think it's really important for people to look at what has really transpired to mold our experience on this planet in this third dimension the way that it is and then to stop and think about is that really the choice that you want to continue to make you want to continue to make the same choices that follow with the control mechanisms or not yeah I mean I mean obviously uh it all boils down to choices. Um, hence the, 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 the most popular phrase, free will. Um, it is a personal choice. Um, the story, uh, someone actually pointed this out. Gee, there's a lot of war going on for these advanced societies, isn't there? And it's like, well, yeah. Um, that should be obvious by now. Look at the state of things on this planet. Uh, that's not a coincidence. Um, and, and do we want this? Uh, I know I don't, and I know one or two people that don't. <laughs> so I am ways. I'm, I'm with you, Brian, yeah. in your camp, dude. Sure, sure, we all are. I mean, yeah. it, but, but basically... I guess in a nutshell, the Book of Man is a political treatise on the history of the existence of, of our species and, the, and those who are responsible for us. Our it, existence. It, it, it's a political yeah. story. And it, it is. is. It's highly political. It is. Uh, it's, and I'm not a political person. I, I loathe the subject. But unfortunately, again, it is what it is. It's a political story because there, there is politics going on out there dirty, it's nasty, it's gruesome, it's anus, and, and there's no way around it. Well, yes, there is a way around it. Uh, hopefully we can get to that pretty quickly, uh, but um, it's, a, it's an individual choice. Do we want to continue in this vein? You know, uh, I mean, how many more times can you, can you go shopping? How many more times can you pay your taxes. How many more times, or how many more houses do you have to buy? How many more cars do you have to buy? How many more children do you have to send to war? At some point in time, somebody somewhere is going to put their foot down and say, enough is enough. And it, I think we're coming to that point rather quickly. And I think they know it's coming. And I... Uh that whole process, what you just said there, was enough to have another show with. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have we'll have to pick this up again. Uh, seriously, this was uh, this has been a delight, man. And I mean, we just just we just scratched the surface of this. Oh, this, um, is this is it fun. was it was great fun. So I hope that everyone does go and watch it, and and please donate. Um, help help uh, Brian get some some more books out there, some more chapters up, et cetera, and so forth, because I think it's um, it's a it's a definitely a worthy thing to uh, to you know put some cash in your pocket for. I really do, um, Brian. I, I I can't thank you enough for sharing your time with me tonight. Um, you share your time with me several times a week as it is, so I want to thank you for coming forward and. Um, uh, just divulging some of this, and I really, truly hope that people will get out there and, and watch it. And if you if you have about six hours, then sit down and just watch one right after the other. I I tell you, your mind will just it will just it will grow. It will be absolutely fabulous. Um, I will see you back here on Tuesday, and I hope you all have a really, really great day. And I want to say um, 
thank you to all the veterans um, here and across the globe for this day. And thank you, Brian, for being here, JP, for running the back uh, backboard. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter, journeyswithrebecca.com. Until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings, everyone, and good night.